Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Harebrain Games. Today we're going to take a look at a game called Time of Crises, Roman Empire in Turmoil 235 to 284 AD. That is a mouthful. Uh, picture a time when barbarous forces were squeezing the empire from all sides. Uh, a disgruntled populace and opportunistic folks were uh, within the Roman Empire fracturing it and you get plopped with up to three other players smack dab into this party uh, armed with barely a toga and a plastic dagger uh, from there it's kinda up to you to forge a path of taking over as emperor uh, but taking it over is not enough keeping it well that's the trick uh, I played this game back in 2017 when it originally came out at uh, various conventions locally and uh, I thought it had an interesting take. It was a, a departure from the more conventional hex and uh, unit type uh, affairs uh, relating to the topic or any topic. However, recently with the addition of the expansion and its support for AI players, I, am a, I was a little invigorated to bring this back to the table. Now, I know what you're saying. Why on earth do we need yet another deterministic deck building game featuring area control, power plays, and player conflict in the early AD days of ancient Rome, right? You know? Well, hopefully this review will help you decide if you need yet another one of those. Now I will note that I am reviewing this with the, uh, the Iron and Rust expansion because I wouldn't ever play without it, frankly, so that's kind of a giveaway on my opinion on the expansion. Uh, though for the life of me, uh, I found nothing in this expansion that was either rustic nor ironic, so naive am I. And with that, let's get to the game. <clears throat> okay, let's take a look at the components inside the box. First off, we have the map. Gorgeous mounted map. Absolutely lovely looking. And then around it, you have each of the barbarian hordes are arranged around the center of the Roman Empire at the time. These will wreak havoc when they are activated, and they will slowly, slowly grow, and then they will invade in and will crush you if you're not careful, or at least crush areas. You have the score track with your legacy token and the emperor turn. Uh, these come into play because this is really the endgame condition. And then you have different various uh, pretend emperors that you can actually contend with contend with the pretend. Also we have an event deck. Now if you roll a 7 you will get events and these events will change gameplay radically over the course of a turn until the next event. Uh, they're good and bad and all points in between. Uh, then we have the bot. This is in the expansion and being in the expansion you will see that it has a different personality. One of three personalities, quasi-personalities. Uh, we'll talk about that more later. Uh, it also has a four page placard AI guide and this is all you need to know to be able to control all three of the bots that you are playing with. Again, we'll go over that later. Uh, both of the manuals are succinct but very detailed and very uh, to the point. And then each player is going to have their own play area placard with their deck of cards to begin with. You will have uh, governor tokens, one you'll begin with, general tokens, one you'll begin with, and uh, and then these you'll grow, you'll pay influence for, and add generals and governors over time. Uh, the card itself gives you everything you need to know about how to spend your points, uh, your turn sequence, all the different actions in the three realms. Everything's here um, to be able to let you manage your empire completely. Very nice. The red turns, and then we have the cards. Now the expansion doubles the amount of cards, which is utterly essential in my mind. Each of these cards is used not just for the influence, but also for the action. That might be a little different for people who are used to playing either or. This one's you get the influence, and you can also take the action on the card when it's played. So double bonus. Uh, you have upgrades, which you can use in your provinces to be able to do things like make it easier to govern. Uh, you can hold back uh, barbarian forces for a little longer with limes. Um, you also have units that you'll purchase for your generals, military units, uh, all custom named, very fancy. The number on the front and back is the amount of die or these 
die roll that you need to hit. Three hits, but if you get wounded, five hits, and then after that, the token's gone. Plus, you have militia markers that stay in an area, but can be used for defense, and they always hit on a five or more. Uh, you have mob counters, because once the mobs start rolling, they get larger and larger, unless you can quell the mob rule. Uh, you have uh, neutral governors, which you'll easily sideswipe as you begin the game, and uh, no place governors. If you play less than four players, that blocks off an area, and you have dice. Dice are uh, square things that you roll, and numbers show up on the top. <coughs> Kidding. Anyway, that's it. Now let's get into some gameplay. Begin, shall we? Turn one always involves the bots. So we're going to go over here and we're going to start. The bots don't have cards. Instead, what you do is you follow the yellow brick road. If there are two cylinders in the zero track, and they're not, I'll explain it to you. If the AI is not emperor and has 50 legacy, nope. If the AI has any troubled provinces, troubled is basically when you have trouble afoot in the province in the form of barbarians or... Um, etc. Uh, if the AI has mobs, it does not. If none of the above, you go into mode 1. Now that means you place this here. What does that mean? It means that your primary influence will be there, and your secondary military will be on the bottom spot. The bottom spot. Now see, as these go, as you increase in uh, in influence, and this will happen, this, instead of cards, you're going to go up the track. So instead of having a more powerful hand, you're going to have more um, of an idea of yeah, that you get more powerful with more uh, influence to spend. And these are events. These allow the AI to have events. They have separate kind of alternate ideas of what happens when the events occur. Uh, um, like if a player played a card, that would be one thing. But when the AI has an, an opportunity, then it will do something a little bit different. Either way, it affects the game, etc., etc. So with that, we now have an opportunity um, there's a couple extra steps that might add some more influence under certain conditions, but for this point, this three goes over here, and this two goes over here. And those are the points to spend. Now this is where it gets interesting, because we're going to go through our little, our little chart. Now what's cool about the chart is that uh, because you're only spending two sort of spheres at a time, military... Um, Senate or populace, you know that basically if if the if the uh, influence tokens that you have they are if if you don't have the yellow one for example here you know you can just skip this entire third of it so on any given given roll you're probably only you're going to be able to pretty much chop off a third of the of the um, chart and not even have to worry about it so it does expedite matters the first thing you do is you go through the military section here because we have military points to spend and it asks certain things will we attack well we don't have anybody to attack yet uh, do, do we have anybody yeah if AI is emperor so skip 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 see how easy that is um, and then you attempt to govern. If there's no governor in the leader's box, and there currently is not any governor in their leader's box, then you uh, basically are going to try and recruit the governor. Well, how easy is that? Basically, you look and go, oh, I have a, a one governor. Hello, gov. Cost me one point. So I place that. Now it's ready to go. And then this drops down one to cover the cost of it. So you were able to place the governor. Now it's a matter of do we place it on the map somewhere. And so you go through the rules and determine are there any places where you can place this on a map somewhere. Right now, taking over neutral provinces is pretty easy. All you have to do is have as much influence needed as there is votes. But if you have players or players with quaesters, uh, then you'll need to be able to have more than that. And so this, we have two. And so we can look around the map, and in the case of ties, there's a tie-breaking element to it, but let's say for the sake of example, we're going to do this. And this, we're going to spend two influence points, double. Basically, you take, if it was two, it'd be four. If it's three, it's six. It's four, it's eight influence required. And we don't need to roll dice on this because it's a success. It's guaranteed success. If it was a player, it would not be guaranteed success. This goes back in. And now we have two provinces for the AI and spent our two influence points. Then we continue on and uh, train the AI's emperor. If the opposing player is emperor, add legion to the army with the fewest legions. Then determine if the AI will attack. So in the case of ties, so we have enough to basically buy a legion. Uh, legions are 
uh, number of legions in the army after adding it. So we have this army, and so we can add to it. Actually, I should double check that rule here. If the AI is emperor, if the opposing is her. Yeah, add legion. If it has no general. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I can add. Yeah, no, I can. So I'm going to add himself a, a army here, I believe. So one, it'll cost me two because two, one plus one is two. And that will take me through this turn. And that's it for that. Oh, <laughs> silly me. I forgot the most obvious one. We always roll for a crisis. Because the bots follow the same turn as everyone else. So we have to roll a... Silly me. Uh, roll is five. Five says the Sassanids. The Sassanids are over here. So one of these guys becomes active. Then we roll the die again. If the black die is less than or equal to the number of Sassanids out there, then they spread across the map. Barbarian horde! Um, and they will use this to determine which way to go. In this case, if this was a 1, then this guy would be 4 to 6 Syria. This would basically pop down to Syria and start making trouble there. Uh, sorry about that. I'm sure someone caught that and went, hey, you didn't do the event. Anyway, so we're done with that. We're done with the actions. We do a support check phase. And so in each province uh, containing a rival emperor or active barbarians or an enemy army in the capital, um, you get minus one support in that province. If you're in Italia, there are some special rules as well. Um, if you're a pretend empire, there's a phase for that, but we don't have any pretend empires. We gain legacy for governed provinces. You gain a legacy for every province, and so that is two. These are for hell. If you're if you take over Italia, then each turn you get, get you're in Italia, you're gonna get moving along the track, and there's a bonus at the end for whoever has been in there the longest. So, and then finally you buy and trash cards. Now this is something the players would do. This is not something that the AI does. Instead, the AI adds up the amount of inf or amount of influence it has in all of its regions, and then starts cascading influence down to decide if it can move up. We have two. One plus one is two. We have two, two governor level, and so we go down the list. Now, the first thing is always, always Senate. In the, in the, if the Senate's zero, then it's a no-brainer. You always move it. Otherwise, you're going to look uh, for the what the what the AI has for its primary influence, which in this case is the Senate anyway. If it was not, then that would be the next thing. It always tries to, to move forward with a thing it likes the most, be it uh, the Senate, the military, or the populace. In this case, it's easy. We have two points, we move it over. And now in future bot turns, whenever um, Senate... Uh, Senate uh, influences to be placed, it's going to go here, and now it has four to spend, and it has an event to play. And that is the end of their phase. That's the end of the bot. Now we're going to get to the human players, which is probably what most humans care about. Player, we begin. We have five cards to spend. Now these are pretty easy cards to begin with. This is yeah, we have two red influence to spend and three blue influence to spend. First off, we don't have anything to upkeep, so we're going to skip that. The crisis phase, roll it again, three, four, five, look at that, another Sassanid. Now we have two of them, so if we roll a black two again, that means trouble. We don't, we roll black three, so nothing happens there. That's quick. Then we take our actions. Now with three Senate points to, or three, yeah, Senate influence to spend, we have some choices. Uh, most of it is, well, place governor, recall governor, recruit governor. We don't have a governor right now, so we're going to have to recruit one. That's pretty easy. There you go. It's going to cost one of my influence to recruit. And then I can also try and place one, and guess what? I'm going to. I think I would like to place, I can't do it in Italia, because that would be literally 12 points of influence. I can't do that. I'm going to do it here, here instead. I'm going to spend the two, swap it out, look at that. Life is golden. I've spent all of my, my influence. Now, why, why is that important? Because I'm expanding my empire, and I didn't have to roll uh, with this one, although I could have, because... Basically, the rules for this are that if you get, uh, um, I think a one is a failure, sixes, sixes are, are double rolled, um, 
you know, so this, I mean, you're, you're going to get success against that. Against players, that's a little bit different because you have an opportunity to maybe not have success, and that's when you want to overspend. We're not overspending yet. Then we have two red. Now, what does that let us do? Well, right now we got nothing. We don't have any generals, so we're going to do an obvious thing and say, hey, I'm going to spend one on a general. That's right. And then, <laughs> I don't have an army. So I'm going to create an army, and because I have a place to put it now, um, I can one red point, general counter, familiar views, full strength legion, we play. yep. So we take this, and we take this, and we're going to create ourselves. Yay, look at that. Now we have more armies. Life is good. And we've spent all of our, all of our cards. We chose these cards. We didn't randomly do it. We get to pick. That's the one thing about it that you'll know is that you you don't have to randomly shuffle and grab cards. The cards you pick are the cards that you choose in each hand. Uh, the other thing to note is that you don't have any, as far as military, you're moving from province to province. So that has to be adjacent. But if you're dealing with replacing governors or trying to get control influence in areas politically, there is no, there is no boundary you know, you don't have to just do it near adjacent areas. You can pick anywhere you want and try to volley for position. So that really opens the map up considerably and uh, limits bottlenecks. And with that, we gain legacy. We too get two legacy. And after that, we can buy or buy cards. Now we have two influence to spend, and this is where we start actually adding to our hand. Now we can spend three to trash a card, which is what we eventually would want to do with some of our weenie cards, but in this case we have two to spend, so we've got cavalry that uh, um, that gives us an, an edge in battle, you can uh, ties go to the uh, yeah, the ties go to the attacker instead of the defender. Caster markers help defend areas so that they're harder to take on. Uh, Quaster, Quaster, um, uh, makes it harder to basically take over a, a, a province. We'll do flip all barbarian counters of a single tribe to their inactive side in any one province. Flip barbarians, defend as normal, but do not cause support loss. We're going to take this one, because if we do find ourselves being attacked from any of these guys, we might want this to be able to flip them to an inactive side, which means that we won't lose points for it. And there we go. That's done. Now, uh, if there's any provinces that have mobs, we would add more mobs to those provinces. So the mob always grows until it overwhelms. And actually, you will lose control if the number of mobs is greater than or equal to your influence in that region. Now, we draw five cards. One, two, three, four, five. And that is the cards that we're going to have for our second hand. Second hand information right there for you. All right, now we're going to go to... And I will pick this one a little bit differently because I want to show you some of the... Some of the um, the things that will happen. So I'm going to pick these five cards as my starting hand instead of the other way around. So, here we go. We roll the dice. Ten. Ten is the Goths. All right. So if your kids ever go goth on you, you'll know where to find them. All right, four. Okay, do we need to have a one? Nope. Nothing there. So slowly the horde grows. Then we take our actions. Now this time, I'm going to, and I'm not saying these are smart moves, they're just demonstrable moves. Once again, we're going to use oh, foolishness. Foolishness. I'm going to swap that out. Pretend I didn't do that. Pretend I did this instead. Because I need A to be able to pay one to get a governor. And then I want to pay two so that I can place that governor. We'll do Syria. There we go. Are you serious? All right, there we go. Isn't that good? Now I'm taking a risk militarily. I think I'm fine, but I've used up my three influence. Now I have two populace, and I can increase my support level. To do that, I pay yellow points equal to the value of the next higher space on the support track to move my governor to that space. Look at that. Now I've got more influence, which is going to make it a little easier to control that uh, other than military. Now it's the support check. Once again, I have no barbarians. I have no mobs. I have bliss. So we gain legacy. One, two. It's not the number of influence, it's the number of, of uh, controlled provinces. So two, and but now we have three to spend. Look at that. Now one thing to notice is that if you don't, if you have a card that's greater than the amount of uh, influences that you have, or 
the provinces you control, um, then you have to pay double. So right now I have two provinces. So for me to buy a level three card, uh, yeah, that would not be good because I would have to pay six. And that's not good because I don't have six. So I still have two though. I'm going to take a Castra. And the Castra is fun. Look at the Castra. A Fidel Castra right here. So that one, uh, Yep, the number of hits inflicted is used by so basically it's it's a nice it's a nice way for your units to be protected from at least the first hit. Pretty cool. Alright, so with that we're done. We've uh I mean I could have also trashed a card if I felt like it with those three instead of taking a card and then losing the last influence point, but I didn't. And there we have our that's it. That's the end of the turn, and now we're back to the bot. I'm not going to waste time going through each and every session of this. Um, I'm going to actually fast forward a bit to a different get to a game state and show you uh, a couple different spot things that go on. Uh, but other than that, everything else just flows with this buying cards, using cards, etc. So give me a second, and we'll go over a advanced state of the map. One other side note is that as the neutral governors were removed from the table, I should have been dropping influence in Italia. So let's reset that and make sure that it's understood that every time that we take over a province in Italia, or province that was owned by whoever owns Italia, we do drop the influence because this is directly affected by the amount of governors you own. So for example, if yellow had been in Italia, it's it would have a two influence. So just letting you know that farther in the game so let's go over some game state that we have right now we have a, an upgrade built here in our red player this is Syrian province this amphitheater means that mobs do not grow at the end of the turn like they normally would mobs that grow large enough can actually dethrone a governor and so in this case the mob is here it will cause issues but it will not grow uh, naturally it has to be um, yeah, it's basically stifled from the mob growing any larger because of the amphitheater. So that there's fine. We have cards to play. Uh, a mob lets us actually put a mob anywhere where there isn't a mob. And so, for instance, if we wanted to cause some trouble, put them there, and suddenly yellow has two provinces with mobs to contend with. That's something that can be done as well. Uh, there's also initiating attacks. In this case, we have barbarians here. And notice limes actually as as these should for example the galls come through here, everything down here has to is flipped inactive for a turn because of limes, otherwise it would just go through. So limes disease has weakened the barbarians, so to speak. So then it's time for battle. Now in this case you would pay one military point and you would be able to take this set of units and you would be able to attack this set of units. Now when that happens, the way that battle works is that you have you roll dice and inflict hits simultaneously. Each six, six gives you another roll. Armies in bottle can't move or initiate actions until their owner's next turn. Hits inflicted on your forces are taken in order of militia, barbarians, and legions. You can have guest barbarians on your show. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take and roll. It's simultaneous, it doesn't really matter what order, but we're going to take and roll two dice. Militia um, on five, guess what, that's a hit, and that on three or more. So look, two hits. So we know we're going to take out the Barbarians. But the Barbarians get a chance too. They get a parting shot. They always hit on a four. Nope, there's one hit there, and a hit on a two. So only one hit here. So how we're going to resolve this is that these two are gone. Goodbye. They go back into the inactive queue. This is a hit, though, and uh, the militia take it first. They only take one hit, and they're gone. If it had been this, it would have been flipped over, and it would get a chance to remain a little longer. But that's the end of the battle. Now you get two points for a victory, plus you get a point for each barbarian you took out, so now we've got yellow back up in the running because of that combat. And that's very simple combat. Very easy to work with so and that's that we didn't go into the emperor uh, yellow has taken over italia which means that they're going to earn uh, some decent points um, actually yeah i did it right um 
earn some points because they happen to be the emperor. Um, there's no pretender or royal emperor on the map, so they're going to earn some some legacy uh, points equal to uh, their current value, I believe. Plus, they'll they'll get another chance to spend another turn as emperor. So. Uh, it doesn't look like a battleground yet. Uh, I definitely suggest watching some videos online if you can find them that will actually show a gameplay session start to finish. That's going to give you a real better understanding of sort of the flow of the game than what I've given you. I showed you the first turn, which admittedly is pretty simple. We can get into event cards, which if you roll a 7, which is a very common number, there are events that will stay in play. Things like you get bonuses, uh, you know... You, uh, one to the value of all Roman dice rolled in battle. That's uh, that's pretty cool. Raiding parties, etc., etc. Uh, if the Diocletian event, which is almost always in the, which is in one of the back four cards, is drawn, the game is over. Uh, otherwise. The game is over when a player uh, hits 60 points and then uh, final scores are tallied. Uh, this is admittedly, like I said, is not a full-fledged overview. Maybe someday if I catch a, a, some initiative and motivation, I would, I would do a full playthrough and that would give a better idea of the rules. Um, but I did give you hopefully an example of kind of the things going on. There's a lot going on here, despite the simplicity and flow of the game and a lot of interesting decisions to make. In fact, I don't think there's a, an uninteresting decision to be made, in fact. So with that, let's get to my final thoughts on what I think of Time of Crisis. All right, final thoughts on Time of Crisis, the Roman Empire in turmoil 235 to 284 AD with the Iron and Rust expansion pack. That was a mouthful. Let's get into the cons first, and there aren't very many. Uh, the first few turns you take of this game, it feels like a generally slow ramp up. That might be a bit of a surprise, but it's, yeah, you feel like you're kind of, uh, yeah. Let's try this again. Okay, final thoughts on Time of Crisis, the M Roman Empire in turmoil 235 to 284 AD with the Iron and Rust expansion pack. That was a mouthful. Uh, cons. Let's go with the cons first. There's a, a, a marked uh, a, like curve to feeling like you're really powerful in the game. The, the first few turns are generally pretty pedantic and probably kind of indistinguishable. Like you start small, that's okay. Uh, but it is something where you're going to feel like, like it'll take a few turns before you start to feel like you've got a direction, in my opinion. It's kind of like you're thrown into a into a quake match with a sidearm. And like, okay, first thing i got to do is ramp up. This is not a con, this is the way it is. It's just, it's it does seem pronounced. And that feeds into sort of the second issue, which is that turns do take time. This is a game that will take a solid three hours, or has, at the conventions playing it, and part of it's because, um, you know, there's there's not a too much shortcut. There's a way to overlap the last two steps, I believe, of the game uh, turns, and so you get a little bit of kind of a crunching together, but generally speaking, people are going to take their time, particularly later in the game, and making the choices, and so you will, in a four-player game, be spending a lot of time watching, but uh, I didn't personally find that too much of an issue, because I was pretty invested in tracking game state and being engaged beyond just what I did on my turn, but seeing what the impact on the board was going to be for others, so... That's about it. Not really a, a huge con at all. The AI uh, rules were tougher for me to grok than they should have been, probably because I overthought it. Uh, that's on me, not on the game. Uh, the bots, uh, if you're going to play the bots, especially if you're going to do solo, true solo, three bots and you, do it for the love of the bots as well, or else I think you're probably going to feel like you have just a minuscule uh, amount of time that really is your turn versus the time you're spending uh, pulling the ropes and, and turning the gears on the bots. I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll have a quick splash of a turn and then you go around and force march the bots. If you're into role playing with the bots, that's great. It's fun to set them up, it's fun to play their actions and watch the results, uh, but it is kind of a duck-duck-goose where you're 
sitting in a circle and maybe 13 seconds out of every five minutes there'll be excitement but it'll be cool excitement and so that's why you do have to do it for the love of the game and not just if you're interested in simulating it i actually in in sort of uh, contrast to some other opinions felt like the space quarter and uh scythe sort of well space quarter with its simple simple solo handling uh scythe with its autom automata automata and, uh, you know, Great Western Trail, some of the others that have Autonoma, I think they do a really good job of simplifying it such that you can spend the lion's share of your time on your turn. Uh, the the uh, AI in those cases doesn't so much simulate as it simply just cuts to the chase and says, pretend I did something and here's what the board state's going to look like when I'm done. Uh, that also does lead to imprecision of, of the cho logic choices for those, for those bots, and so you do know that you're making a trade-off. But here I thought, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would have wanted that approach anyway for this game, but we'll get into that when I get into the pros. Okay, pros. What do I like about the game? A lot. Um, I like that the card drafting is so de delightfully deterministic that I don't feel that I, I, I feel a sense, a vivid sense of, of self-direction with me to thank or to blame for whatever happened out of it. It's not card driven in the conventional sense of certain games that are card driven games where I maximize the hand I'm dealt. It's more like I dealt myself the hand I'm dealing with knowing that I made trade-offs as to what's in this hand versus what I'm saving for next hand. Uh, that's great. The map is gorgeous. Oh, I love this map. It is just, del oh, I love it. I could, I could walk St. Paul's missionary journeys through it in, in, a, in a glance and just kind of feel, <laughs> feel like I'm there. It's really good. Um, the general, uh, yeah, it's the game is not, and it has to be understood that it's not a boots on the ground, um, memoir forty four kind of thing. But at the same time, it's not a high level cataclysm level extract abstraction either at bird's eye view. In fact, it's probably the height of maybe an African swallow, uh, which is an interesting place to be because you have general and army movement uh, at a kind of a macro decision level, but you're still granular enough that you actually uh, can you know know your units by name, which is a very cool feature by the way. Um, there's also influence jockeying between you know three spheres of power uh, you know your popular power your uh, senate power your military power that all need to intertwine and uh, be fed and nurtured in order to do your best at the game the power plays that players have on the emperor's seat or fracturing off to, to provide a force significant enough to be a pain in the butt to the weak standing emperor or the currently standing emperor um, yeah I, I just yeah that's good and then I well I did have sort of a a ding trying to figure out the the AI rules it's it's fair to say that they did a really good job of making what I think is a sensible and concise AI bot uh, to act on behalf of pretend players uh, they um, it's a one pager so it's really simple rules although let's be honest it's two pages there's one page but then there's a, a whole subsection that's a second page that deals specifically with how you choose to attack or move um, uh, but they tried hard to balance the best of both worlds between, you know, they didn't they didn't get into this sort of like exhausted nested if then that would just bog it down like I've seen some 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 bot kind of situations do. Uh, but at the same time, um, it, it still is light enough to be easily doable, but still you know, mostly plausible. Um, you know, sans the occasional silly edge case, whatever. Uh, I had fun, and I had fun with the bots because I chose to to really invest in the sort of the backstory of each of the AIs. They do have personalities, and it makes sense the way the bots flow. I love that you're not simulating the entire other person. They do simplify down to you have almost a resource of colored points, and you use those points until you can't use them anymore to make the most logical decisions. They will be compelling. They will be silly at times, but for the most part, they will feel good. So if you don't mind going through and like being the bot, and then being another bot, and then being another bot, that's great. For me, the perfect fit would be two to three players and then a bot. Um, I would almost rather play two-handed solo with two bots. Uh, but honestly, I have there's no real draw. Like I said, I had issues mostly because I was just overanalyzing things. The AI rules are 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 quite sufficient. And with that, let's get to my final thoughts. You know, I can kind of envision GMT, you know, at some point saying, you know what, we really like King of Tokyo. Let's make a game like King of Tokyo, but historical. 
it's kind of funny to see the parallels to that because you have Tokyo, uh, King of the Hill, you have Italia, King of the Hill. Getting in there is worthy. Staying in there is an exercise of stamina as you're pummeled by everyone that has you in their sights. Um, card play that, that kind of influences what you do on any given turn. You've got dice determination of combat results. Um, that might be a turn off to some, but I think it works really well. It, it works fluidly here and does the job just fine. Um, you can win being in Tokyo, or I mean Italia, uh, if you or outside of it. I mean, it's okay. Maybe it's not a direct correlation, but it is interesting to to feel like I'm playing historical King of Tokyo in this way. But that doesn't really do a complete job of explaining just why this game is so interesting because it does have a balancing act of being both a deck collect, you know, a, a simple idea of the Roman conflicts of that era, uh, but at the same time not becoming silified. Uh, and I think they did a good job of jockeying and, and, and you know, parlaying all the different approaches to come up with a very unique game that I think is a good game type and a good game sort of design that could be applied in other arenas as well uh, to equal effect. I, um, it's neither too simple, it's neither too complex, uh, it only has the fact that the turns are lengthy and sequential that might keep it hold it hold it back because it really is a three hour game and some people when they hear deck building they're going to think thirty minutes forty minutes or they're going to think that there's a more there's a rapidity to the place of turns that just isn't there that's not what this is uh, don't be derailed by thinking this is a a, a dominion for gladiators it's not it's completely different in a great way the expansion really fully realizes I didn't talk about one of the aspects which is your own sort of emperor level thing but there were three things that come in the expansion the extra cards which you can't go without the bots which is great for adding and filling in players when everyone else is uh, you know, at a Mariners game um, and then the other the other the other expansion I played with a little bit but honestly I find it I may or may not play with that one, but the, the other two aspects of the of the expansion are a no-brainer. You pick it up and you play with it. So, um, yeah, definitely, definitely thumbs up on this one. I do like it. I like it. I will pull it out and play it uh, as frequently as I can with the right group of people that understand it's not Dominion with Gladiators. Um, they ironed, I mean, the expansion ironed out the biggest complaint I have and rusted their case that it's a solid and excellent entry in the GMT lineup. So once again, time of crisis with the expansion, definite thumbs up. So take care and we'll see you next time on Hairbrain Games.